Hey guys, we're live. Let me see. Let's get everybody set up. Let's get everybody joining in. Welcome everybody. Today's going to be a good night. We got a special guest. Drop a lot of valuable information, a lot of insights. Hey, Ansi, how's it going, man? Yo, bro, you hopping on? Yo, yeah, Ansi. Yo. Yo, I'm, I'm, I'm in the live right now. You gonna hop on? Live what? Uh, we're streaming already, dude. Facebook? Yeah. Yo, Jordan, what's good, man? Showtime, let's go. All right, we're going to have everybody. So the thing is, uh, our special guest doesn't have Facebook. So he's going to hop on through Google Meet. So we're just making sure he gets everything set up. Google Meet is up and running. Just waiting them for uh, I'm just waiting for him to hop on. And I'm streaming the audio from Google Meet to Facebook so you guys can hear it well. Now, let me ask you, Jordan, can you hear me good, bro? Everything good? Hey, Larry, what's good, man? If you want to hop on the Google Meet, I already sent you the link. Hey, I saw, yeah, these, um, after the live is done, they'll be uploaded to a group so everybody can replay. Pull up the topics. So we want to talk about a little bit of business evaluations. That is key. Some insights, red flags, things to watch out for. And some topics for tonight that I gathered uh, by speaking to some of the members in the group is we're looking to talk about overview of M&A. What is M&A? How can it uh, uh, how can it help you grow? Building your board, some insights, recruiting people. All right, let's see. Can't see Monsieur on hop then. Can't see. Hey, what's going on? Then we got growing your company through acquisitions. The micro and the macro side of things, getting out, uh, getting out of the day-to-day -day operations and venturing off into something bigger, and talking about mentors as well. Grazie, where you at? Your mic is super loud, dude. So let me see. I'm trying to fix this. So how's everybody? Uh, How's everybody doing? Just want to make sure everybody's good on the same page. Let me open up my Facebook. <laughs> Larry, Brandon, what's good, guys? And there's going to be a good night, so give it a couple minutes to start. You already know. Every live, you got to prepare it. Tatum, Asa, Yumong, all good. Guys. Uh, there's gonna be a good night, so give it a couple minutes to start. You already know. Every night you gotta. Hey, is okay. what's up? Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. So, um, can I get your names just to know who's who? Yeah, everybody. It's me, Ansi. I always say, once you see me, you can't unsee me. Quick question, Valentino: Are we doing? Uh, this and uh, Facebook Live as well, right? Yeah, so I'm streaming essentially the audio from uh, mm -hmm. the Google Meet to the Facebook so everybody can hear you. Okay, perfect. Hey, guys, just a quick check. Uh, everybody can hear Ansi, right, and the other members. Say hi, Ansi. Hey, what's going on, guys? All right, let me know if you can. What's up? Uh, Sam, we got Sam here, Captain America. What's good, man? Oh, you know, another day. <laughs> Another dollar. 
That's what's yes, up. Sir, that's me. Hey, what's up? Can you hear me? This is Larry. Hey, Larry, what's good, brother? How are you? We can hear you good. Good, good. So our special guest, is he going to hop on? Yeah, yeah, he's going to hop on in a few minutes. Uh, I sent him the link. Okay, guys, so just it give it a, uh, a few minutes. Let me ask you, uh, you guys can hear everything well? Just want to make sure. Let me check how many people are on the live right now. Okay, Jordan Lean said Charlie. they could hear us all. We're good. Oh, man, this is going to be a good night. <laughs> a lot of info. Hey, this Friday, moving on, we're going to make history. The quality of the content that's going to be reported from now on is going to be above and beyond. So that's what we expect to keep it at. Beautiful. Everybody said they could hear us loud and clear. We got 25 people watching. No way. <laughs> What's up, guys? Hey, so um, members of the call, you can introduce yourself, starting with Captain America. Yeah, this is Captain America, also Samuel List. Um, long story short, military background, uh, created my board in the Middle East. Went to healthcare, um, talked to some field matter experts, uh, also in politics, um, getting my board back together after firing them, um, looking at create, going into a new sector. Beautiful. Uh, Larry, how about yourself? Hey, can you hear me okay? All great, all great, brother. Good. Hey, group. Um, currently been doing uh, the QLA for about a year. I do have Dan Pena as my chairman. Um, we had three deals uh, just weeks and months before the coronavirus. They all fell apart, and it's time to restart. So here we are. You heard it, guys. Uh, good night. This guy, Larry, he has uh, Dan Pena himself as his chairman. Uh, tell me, what's your experience working with Dan, Larry? Um, he pre pretty much the same. Um, he does, you know, when we do our one-on-ones, he, he, he does have a, a, a lot more to say uh, than he does, I, obviously, on camera. And uh, he does help a lot with uh, some of the structure that we do. And, you know, he just tells it to you straight. And um, he did help me attract some really, really high-profile people on my board. So I've got some Microsoft guys. I've got some guys from... CSNBC, um, some experienced m and guys. I think you've seen them before, uh, Valentino. Yeah, I, I saw it. Info. The executive summary, yeah, but you saw so, the dudes. Yeah, and uh, my sector is pretty much healthcare. So looking forward to helping out with anyone uh, when I can. So well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump off and let everyone else go. All right, Nancy, just a little introduction. Everybody knows who's Nancy already. <laughs> yeah, well, basically, almost everybody. Um, I'm in healthcare as well. Uh, been in this almost a year. Got started just because I heard the word EBITDA. Stumbled across the Pena a few months later. Um, got started from a M&A attorney and a real estate investor who just happened to buy businesses. That's when I learned what a consolidation was. And um, that's when I learned that if you speak to any venture capitalist, or, um, you know, investment banker, they will tell you that this model is the model that, you know, startups favor. If you don't have cash, you offer equity. If you have equity, you don't, um, you don't offer cash, right? So, I'm sorry, if you don't have cash, you offer equity. If you have, uh, uh, if you don't have cash, you offer equity. If you have cash, you don't offer equity. I'm sorry. So, with that being said, I'm in healthcare. We have eight deals right now. We have some that, we had more than that. Some fell apart. We have eight right now. Um, and we have uh, two drafted LOIs, and two more will be signed next week. And I will be walking a total of five facilities next week uh, overall. And honestly, out of all the deals we have, we look like uh, it looks like we can close on two guaranteed. So that's where we are right now. Great, Roger said no, <laughs> Larry. No one will throw you out if Dan's your chairman. Low one trillion dollar man. You already know Dan's gonna chop heads. <laughs> that's funny that's funny uh 
No, our board stayed together. We 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 uh, not, we haven't lost anyone, but yeah, he he made me look good. We had a we had a board meeting um, at the DLA Piper office, and he had my back. He stepped in the breach, like you said. Anytime somebody got out of line, it was he was right there, and he pretty much took control. I did learn a lot, so we'll just have to redo it again. So. Yes. But, and, uh, well, now you're not starting from scratch. You're starting from experience, as they say, right? <laughs> there you right, go. right. No, I've been, I've been, I've been all the way. <laughs> uh, it just sucks that you gotta sometimes reboot. So there you go. It's all about being in the trenches, man. So. Yeah, but sometimes for you to realize everything you've learned, you know, you gotta reboot sometimes. Yep. Right. Look, I'm gonna tell you something, guys. It's better to learn early when you don't have much then to learn late and lose it all right <laughs> all right looks like we're gonna have somebody join in okay and then bill bill bill's That's coming bill. in there we go. hey bill how you doing hey can you hear me yeah you sound hey, good. Bill. What's, what's going on bill it's on scene what's happening oh well i mean it looks like uh are everyone called in except me? <laughs> I could call. In. Oh, I didn't realize you could dial in. Yeah, no, I'm on camera right now, but that's all right. That works. Yeah, yeah. We have um we have the majority of the individuals on the Facebook Live, so we did the uh, Google Meet oh, uh, God. for you. Okay. So we have the other individuals um, on the Facebook Live. They can't hear okay. us, by the way. So got it. Uh, got it. Okay. So all if right. you don't mind, Bill, um, we were doing introductions. Uh, you came in the sure. time. I'm glad you could make it. So if you don't mind, just give a you know brief introduction of who you are. Um, yeah, absolutely. No, I'd love to. And um, you know, first and foremost, uh, I just want to say um, you know how how wonderful it is to be you know working with ANSI. I mean, he's very very ambitious, and I'm very proud to be working with him. Uh, and uh, I'm I'm just starting to help him on some of the deals, and in my role. Uh, to start is uh, buy side financial due diligence. Um, and just a little bit about myself. Uh, first of all, Bill Worsema. Um, I've been doing this uh, for quite some time. I, I'm a CPA with an accounting firm called Miller Cooper. We're a regional firm in Chicago, about 400 people. And we've been around 100 years. Uh, actually, effective June of last year was our 100th anniversary. And I have a client that I've been working with the not the entire 100 years, but I am now the relationship partner on that has been with the firm for 100 years. So, um, and it's, it's a luxury automotive uh, aftermarket company. So, so, you know, it's kind of a nice legacy to have. But my specialty is, I'm, you know, that I'm working with, uh, with Anseon is financial due diligence. So, I also maintain the uh, audit client base. I'm a relationship partner, but um, my specialty about half of my time is uh, financial due diligence. And the firm itself uh, started doing this about 20 years ago. I actually founded the practice uh, for quality earnings and, and M&A, and now we're up to almost a dozen people that do nothing but that. So, um, but I'm always involved when it's my clients, I'm always directly involved in, in all the transactions that I do. And my claim to fame is uh, I save a minimum of six figures per transaction. And I can get into that with you. I have gotten into that with ANSI already, um, but mainly it's through the quality of earnings, uh, adjusted EBITDA, uh, through the uh, tax allocations, and also through the net working capital peg and true up. So those are the areas that, that I focus on. And as far as industries, um, wow, you know, I mean, uh, there's been quite a diversity uh, that I've been involved in. I'm actually currently working on a, a healthcare SPAC, you know, in addition to, a, you know, ANSI's deals, which are all healthcare related. I've done a lot of software. Um, I kind of grew up doing manufacturing and actually have a specialty in cost accounting. And if you're interested in more, you know, I don't want to bore everybody to death, but I've, you know, I've written books. Um, I, I do a lot of posting on, on LinkedIn. So if anyone, if anyone wants to um, check it out, you know, please feel free to link with me on LinkedIn, you know, and I, I'd love to uh, correspond with you. And as Ansi knows, I do a lot of writing, you know, I, I mean, if there's a topic that comes up, I frequently am approach, you know, from people about, uh, about M and a taxation, you know, how does that work for buyer and seller, different deal structures. I've also been approached just on structuring questions, um, diligence questions. Uh, I recently did a deal where um, 1099 contractors were a big factor. Personally, I've done um, even articles on personnel compliance, so I was able to uh, uh, help them with that aspect too. So, 
So that's who I am. And, and again, very happy to be here. And and I know ANSI, uh, you know, actually wanted me to address, um, you know, red flags I look for in deals. And and do you want me to do that now or do you want me to shut up and, and let the meeting proceed, ANSI? <laughs> It's up to you. Yeah, yeah, just uh, yeah, just one second. You know, we wanted to get everybody. Um, uh, oh, all right. Uh, and and as I said, I'm prepared to talk about red flags and deals. You know, when it's my turn. So, okay, very good. But great meeting, everyone. Great meeting, everyone. Hey guys, so Perfect. as you know, we got Bill. It. He's an experience in the industry in regards to financials, analyzing businesses, red flags, everything. So that's what we're gonna get started on. Essentially taking a look at, you know, if the deal stands, what makes or breaks a transaction, red flags, what to look for, so on and so forth. So let's get started, Bill. Oh, wonderful. Well, I, I didn't prepare a speech. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, maybe maybe next time if you want One me to. Second, Bill. Um, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Valentino, real quick, is uh, um, just the, the questions that everyone have, just make sure they're writing them down in the chat. Okay. So that way, you know, as we proceed, they don't forget, you know, their point of all. Yeah, right. I got that. Okay, guys, so anybody comment? What are any questions you have in regards to business financials? All right, sorry, go ahead, Bill. Oh, all right. No, no, and as I said, I, I love to present. I actually present to uh, Kellogg's uh, uh, ETA class on due diligence every year. Um, and I'm doing deals with the professor actually is a, is an independent sponsor and I'm working on a couple of transactions with him right now. So I have a whole, whole, you know, PowerPoint deck and presentation I can do. And I'm happy to do that, you know, in full next time, I guess, just, um, you know, what I understood was I could just, you know, address maybe for a few minutes, what I look for in diligence, you know, and things that you should look out for in deals. Um, what I like to start with is, yeah, yeah that, that's basically it. Right. what I, what I like to start with is, financial metrics. So, I, and I'm going to run this on all your deals, Nancy. Uh, basically, I look at, you know, current year to date, analyze it prior year, and then look at industry. And the red flags that come up are generally, where are the outliers? You know, our margins, you know, unusually high, uh, is debt high? Uh, are assets on the balance sheet unusually high? So if I'm dealing with the manufacturer, uh, inventory is always a big question mark. You know, does it look reasonable or not? And sometimes it gives me a lot of comfort because I can tell a lot of times from the balance sheet if a seller is just tax motivated and has written everything off uh, or if they're being aggressive. And and I guess, you know, the main the main lesson that I've learned over the years in, in dealing with, um, you know, various buy side situations is it really doesn't matter to what degree uh, they've had work done on their financials. I've I've. I've gone into situations where an audit was done by a big four accounting firm and basically cut the net income in half, you know, from from uh, the adjustments that I found. So so it doesn't matter. I also deal, though, with the other end of the spectrum where basically you have a tax return at the end of the year, all the records are cash basis and pull that together, you know, into into a meaningful conclusion for my clients. So so. That's kind of the initial approach, and as I said, Nancy, when I as I go through your deals, I'm, I'm going to look at that. So, so those are what I consider kind of the red flags initially. But from there, I would construct a specific program. So, in other words, if inventory looks like a risky area, well, are they a manufacturer? And if so, you know, how are they doing their cost accounting? What kind of controls do they have over inventory? Um, what are their perpetual records like? Do they have cost job costing records? Do they track labor? You know, those types of questions that enable me because how I characterize diligence is a probing. You know, it's not it's not like um, uh, you go in expecting to look at everything. It's more like I'm probing for areas that cave in. You know, I mean, in other words, I'll, I'll put my finger and if it falls into the through the wall, that's the area that I want to look very hard at. Um, that's how I characterize it because you just don't have time to look at everything and no one has the budget to spend on that type of thing. It is it is more of a probing exercise. And when you find something, well, you know, then that turns into the findings and potentially, uh, and, and when you have findings, which inevitably I do, I'd say 98% of the time, I'll have significant findings um, on, the, on the due diligence that I do. And what happens as a result can vary. I mean, one is maybe the buyer's already built in, you know, a certain amount of uh, tolerance for adjustments. So that, that's one situation. 
Um, however, even in those situations, when other negotiations come up, it's good to have these items in your back pocket. I mean, in other words, these can come in handy. At the other extreme, I've had people uh, in transactions where the, the changes that I found are so extreme that it's led to a, a, a withdrawal from the deal or a renegotiation and the withdrawal may be pending redoing the records. And I'm almost on the verge of doing that right now on a deal I'm working on because it doesn't appear. I mean, it appears that the sellers maintain records, but they don't appear to be supportable. You know, they, they, they've done things in QuickBooks that are kind of odd. And I think they plug their balance sheet and they and they uh, try to support a PL. So in other words, the records don't hold together. And it's very unusual to see a situation like that because usually when people are doing accounting, it is double entry, but in this case, it doesn't appear to be. So it may it may lead to uh, more accounting work. And then that would normally, we'd want to transfer to the seller. You wouldn't want to pay for that. So so that's kind of the, the approach. And again, this is all top all off the top of my head here. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not presenting anything, but, but I'd say that those are, the main issues and i guess i'm i'm be happy to go through uh you know any particular industries or questions that you have um you know flesh out uh <laughs> i think i'm losing somebody there but um but i'm happy to go through it uh you know to any degree any depth you'd want to uh any particular situations or questions you have and as i said I got a set deck, you know, that I can do next time, and I'd be happy to do it. I I just wasn't prepared to do that tonight. I didn't, you know, um, I I only just found out about this. So, and as I said, I'm happy to do it though. So no worries. I mean, I'm I'm happy to uh, to do it. Hey Bill, I so, got a question. And, sure. And th this is a big one. So a lot of people who are coming into a market and they're looking to buy a business, right, a small private business, let's say between one to five million EBITDA. Uh, they usually go the broker route, right? There's already businesses that are listed for sale. The owners are looking to sell. But one thing that is very important is what evaluation method you use to make an offer on it where you can figure out what's the true cash flow. Uh, because as what I know, EBITDA, seller discretionary earnings, and NOI has many addbacks. So essentially you're overpaying. And also net, net earnings does not report maybe what's true due to, you know, any depreciation or amortization or, or playing around with taxes and numbers. What do you think is the best way initially without getting involved in too in-depth due diligence to make your offer on? Well, here, here's the answer. I mean, it used to be a lot easier than it is now. Let me put it that way, because it used to be uh, there was more stability. You could go to a source like uh, deal stats and, and look up in the industry what transactions have occurred again all these are anonymously reported you can kind of derive a, a range of, of valuation multiples on ebitda or or with respect to sales or revenue or whatever valuation metric you want to look at from those deal stats but what's happened is you know with covid there was a huge drop off for one thing in transactions for a while there so a lot of the reporting just hasn't caught up i know volume is picking up now but the reporting hasn't caught up but the other problem is that there are companies that are at both ends of the spectrum. Some experienced huge declines and are in big trouble. You know, for example, I was doing MRO uh, transactions uh, near near uh, uh, in Florida. You know, near near ANSI there in, in in Miami, and they were trading at ten multiples. Ten multiples of EBITDA for for one to two million dollar EBITDA businesses. That's that's how intense it was. And now. I'm working on a deal where it's practically liquidation value because it's just turned topsy turvy because of COVID. But conversely, I just represented a seller, and I also do sell side diligence. By the way, I just represented a seller of a PPE company, and they made a killing. You know, there was obviously a windfall for them. So, so really, all the metrics uh, that people have been used to seeing are kind of out the window and unstable and uncertain at the moment. And all that's leading to a greater use of earnouts. Uh, actually, the Wall Street Journal said that. Uh, the incidence of earnouts has doubled from about 25% excluding life science now up to 50%. And I'm doing a session on that in, in February um, for the AM and AA. I'm, I'm moderating a panel on earnouts, just talking about why this is arising, what it means, how to deal with it. Uh, but that's really where the, uh, in terms of valuation, people are filling the gap. It's, it's, it's with earnouts. So, so that would be the conventional way of doing like an initial assessment. Now, I work with a lot of private equity groups too, and, and they basically have proprietary models and it's all some variant of discounted cash flow. I mean, and, and that's really 
if you want to get into um, a more precise way of doing it, you're, you're building your own multiple. Basically, you're, you're going back to all the risk factors involved. You're trying to assess each one individually, building your own multiple, uh, looking ahead to the future. Um, so it's very, it, it's a much more laborious exercise, but that's what people in this environment kind of have to default to. They, they're making more investments in the valuation aspect because there's more uncertainty right now. So, so that's kind of my take on it. Um, but EBITDA has always been the middle market metric. I mean, there are, I mean, and I'm actually doing a, a white paper on this now. I, I know that people like Warren Buffett hate it, but he's at a different market than we are. You know, I mean, EBITDA is, is the number. I, I remember there was one broker uh, who used to walk around saying that he has only one function key on his calculator and that function key was 5X. That was his, uh, that's all his calculator did was 5X. So, I mean, that's how, how um, ingrained it is. And as far as that back, that's why you do due diligence. I mean, it was funny. I, I did a transaction a number of years ago where uh, there was a $5 million EBITDA, but that was only after $7 million in ad backs. So, you know, at some point it becomes ridic ridiculous. I mean, for example, I work in an accounting firm, of course, and, and we're very seasonal and there's going to be downtime during the summertime. Is all that ad an ad back, you know, to a, an accounting firm's EBITDA? I don't think so. But there might be aggressive people that would argue that in some aggressive so, people. Oh, yeah, that's an ad back. You know, you don't even read that was an efficiency. That's an ad back. You know, so in other okay, words, Bill. you have to scrutinize. You really, I mean, the ad backs, you just have to scrutinize. And that's why you bring in a guy like me because I've seen it all. Believe me, I've seen it all. <laughs> but go ahead. Go ahead, Ansi. No, I was going to say so what, what you, uh, so is it that in the lower middle markets, we use EBITDA in the higher markets? um higher enterprise value deals is it that they use a uh, net cash is that what you're essentially saying oh yeah you mean oh i'm sorry you're saying middle market versus i i i'm you're a little muffled there Ansi. but say it one more time i'm sorry oh, can you hear me yeah i can hear you now go ahead no what i'm saying is so um i was trying to paraphrase what you said just to get a better uh, understanding is it that in the lower market well yeah lower middle market if you will you know where we are one right. two three four five million dollar deals is it that right. we use ebitda and the larger enterprise deals 20 50 100 million 200 million or whatever is it that they use net is that what you're saying um, yeah oh yeah. That, no it's it's a whole different that, it's a whole different world yeah if you're dealing with public companies like warren buffett you're you're dealing with a whole different thing you know you're looking at return on capital employed or you know i mean you're, you're doing right you're, right that's what You're I'm doing saying. a whole so, different metric system, yeah, because that's a different okay. world. Our world, our world is EBITDA. You know, our world is just e is EBITDA driven. Is is it? I'm, I've I'm heard working that a lot. Right. I've heard a yeah. lot of people say that. You know, um, if you're if it's EBITDA, you're overpaying. But I ne I never really understood. You know, what the concept is behind it. Of course, I understand it. Yes, you know, right. uh, a lot of things. You know, uh, that's into that you're overpaying for. But the way you un you know you just kind of broke it down. I never saw it that way. Right. I thought no, well, the, and the concept is this. I mean, the concept is this, that, yeah, there's different levels of capital intensity. Yeah, there's different levels of bankable assets. All of that affects multiples. But then you're looking industry specific. You know, everyone knows that, you know, a distributor has a lower multiple than a manufacturer and contractors have lower multiples. You know, I mean, everyone kind of has that in brain because we can see the data. You know, we so, so in other words, we don't have to do. Uh, that level of analysis that's so EBITDA is a good a good metric because we understand that it varies by industry and you know and, and we can we can apply the right number in the right circumstance so that's that's kind of what on that so so is it possible for us to um this is a long shot but is it possible for us to like do maybe a, a example of a deal maybe one that i sent you obviously they won't be able to see the numbers you will but oh yeah, I mean, yeah, no, and, I and unfortunately, the top of my head. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I haven't even I haven't even had a chance to look at that yet. But I could go through another one. I, I just did a um, uh, I did a deal where uh, it's interesting. It's a um, gosh, I can't give it away though. I'm just trying to think of how to describe it. There are implants that are used in certain bones. You know that um, I mean to repair certain bones uh, and and. These are proprietary developed products and this company's looking to go public. And I can go through a diligence with you. I mean, the first thing that struck me about the company was that it had four years worth of inventory. And I'm wondering, what's going on here? You know, there's there's something wrong here. 
And not only yeah, that, no, no, yeah. uh, real, real quick, yeah, but sure. uh, the reason I said uh, Mike is because a lot of us on, um, on this call is, you know, in the same market as I am, you know, the lower middle market. Oh, so, sure. I'm not sure if what would would it differ for a company that's about to go public, you know, versus. Oh no, no, they were they were still early stage. Yeah, they were. I mean, it's a little larger than some of your deals. I mean, it's like they were they're doing like 30 million revenue. So it's not it's not massive, you know. But but just to go through it, you know, quickly, um, an implant company, and and I, so I look at it, wow, four years worth of uh, the inventory, and then I look at fixed assets. Wow, you know, there's there's stuff that's out in you know that they actually had like parts, these kits that were carried as fixed assets. And I'm like, wow, that's kind of unusual. So peeling back the onion, it turned out that they had items out on consignment that had never been verified, never physically verified. And they said, oh, well, we can always get them back. But there was no, no uh, credit assurance with the, their representatives that were selling these items was one thing. For another, it was interesting, but the fixed assets actually were sold about 30% of the time to distributors. They weren't always used in these consignment arrangements. And they put them through fixed assets and they used, <laughs> it was, this, is, this is a fun one, they used a, um, a special method uh, for fixed assets where they relieved the oldest ones first. You know, it's called a pooling method. And you're allowed to do that. But so they wound up at, with every sale relieving zero book value fixed assets. So in other words, they had pure revenue, pure profit, pure EBITDA for every one of these sales just from this accounting method. And this, this was a, a company that was audited by a, a very large accounting firm whose name you'd recognize. Um, and and those, those types of issues just, just kind of uh, really had a huge impact on what they were presenting. So, so, so that's, that's the type of thing that you can encounter. Now, in, in, uh, in typical deals, things like... Um, I mean, issues are gonna come up with unrecorded accruals, they're gonna come up with receivables that are bad. I just did a deal uh, last week where there was a large old receivable. It turned out that it was covered by a retainer that had been taken into revenue. So I mean, it was a pure hit to EBITDA. Um, there have been situations where people capitalize things inappropriately. Okay, we put in new software, so I, we capitalized four months of the CFO salary, okay? I mean, things like that, I mean, so, so it's kind of like, you know, what to look for. Oh, another thing I, I, in a very recent deal, actually in, in on Long Island, a company, a contractor, they included $1.1 million in revenue as they received their PPP loan. It, it, they put it straight to revenue. And, and my buyer didn't know that. And it, and it, okay, so as far as the PPP loan, um, I think you, I'm not sure if it was you. I spoke to so many people. Um, I heard something uh, about if you make if you make an acquisition right now and a company has you know they they got a ppp line how does that affect us and are we able to get like ppp forgiveness for that as a new buyer i think you did talk to me about that <laughs> so yeah and this was long awaited guidance it was issued october 1 and if you check out my linkedin page i even have it posted there the guidance that was issued on october 1st and it was long awaited people were just bumping around in the dark, not knowing what to do when there was an outstanding PPP loan on deals. They just didn't know what, what are you supposed to do with that? Do you have to pay it off? What happens? So what the guidance says, I mean, just to crystallize it is that if the loan is unforgiven, obviously if it's forgiven, nobody cares anymore, but if it's unforgiven, uh, it has to be applied for. Forgiveness has to be applied for. And then you are allowed to escrow a portion of the seller proceeds with the lender. And then at the moment that the SBA forgives the loan, that lender can release those proceeds from escrow to the seller. So, so, wait, so, so you're saying a, a portion of the ag uh, aggregate amount that the seller would get goes into escrow? Exactly, exactly. And, that, and there it sits until the SBA has time to forgive it. Or if they don't forgive it, well, then the seller never sees the money, of course. But, but if, what, as long as they do forgive it, um, let me turn off my, uh, why wouldn't the SBA forgive it though as a new buyer? Uh, no, it, it's all, it, it all depends on old code. So in other words, did old code, uh, spend it on qualifying things, you know, did, did they do the right things? You know, it'll all be old code and none of that comes to you. So you buy the company, that loan remains with old code and, and there it's their, uh, you know, it's their bet, whether it, it's forgiven or not. And as it should be, I mean, you shouldn't be concerned about that. As a buyer but even if even if it's a would, would it matter if it's a stock purchase versus well i don't do stock purchases 
but uh, uh, asset purchase, would we still be no. that? No. Here's the thing, and, I, and I've and i looked into the guidance on PPP2, you know, just to see, uh, and it doesn't even address that yet, but uh, the old PPP guidance, which I can forward you, uh, did indicate that it's either stock or asset doesn't matter. So, um, I mean, there are somewhat different criteria. I mean, actually, if it's under a 50% asset deal, it doesn't even require the escrow. So in other words, there are exceptions, excuse me, based on deal structure. But uh, the general rule is that the loan is the responsibility of the sellers. It should be. I mean, they took out the loan. As you know, any deal that you close, the sellers are responsible for that debt. And generally, it's not assumed by, by you guys, you know, when you buy. So, so that debt, it remains with the seller. Uh, but here's, here's what used to happen. What used to happen is people didn't know what to do with it. They didn't know if they had to pay it off. They didn't know... Uh, if they blew the forgiveness, they didn't know what to do. I mean, it was impairing transactions. But as I said, now there's this method where they have to escrow and um, and then they deal with it after the post-close. I mean, now here's a wrinkle, though. If you're using an SBA 7A loan, here's a bad wrinkle for you to keep in mind. They consider it double dipping if those proceeds are escrowed uh, for the PPP, believe it or not. So in other words, what do you mean? What do you mean? Wait, wow. so in other words, if you're taking out an SBA 7A, um, the SBA will not allow you to escrow those proceeds to pay off the seller's PPP loan. They won't allow that. So it's it's a weird a weird rule. But they, in other words, they're trying to prevent people from borrowing from the SBA to to indirectly get the funds they need for this loan to for for the forgiveness of this loan They're, they they perceive a conflict there a little a little far-fetched in my mind but that's what they perceive so it's just you have to be careful with that if you're doing a how do we get day, around that though well i guess you have to bring in enough fresh capital to cover their ppp and escrow i believe that's how it would be done so as long as you're you're bringing in enough equity yourself or from other sources uh, to cover that PPP escrow, I, I think you'd be able to proceed. It's only that you can't use, you can't touch those um, seven, eight uh, loan proceeds. Uh, I, you can't use those. You can't apply those against the seller's PPP loan escrow. So very that's, that's kind of weird. That's, that's kind of weird since we're not, if it's an asset sale, well, it doesn't matter if it's an asset sale, you said, right? No, no. And, and I'll send you the guidance. As I said, I also posted it. It's only five pages long. So I posted it on, on LinkedIn. If you guys want to check it out, as I said, I encourage you to connect with me. I, I'd really love. Yeah, to yeah, sure, of course. Meet um, you guys. We're definitely going to have uh, everybody on here. Uh, hey, Bill. You know, connect with you. They're going to need your services anyway. Just I'm here for you. Know, <laughs> and uh, let me. The way you, yeah, ahead. let me let me give a pitch. Then you know, if you have deals that you're looking at, you know, I, I know Ansi. He's you know he's a fantastic guy. You're friends of Ansi. I'd love to look at your deals non-charge, you know, in other words, just I'll sign an NDA, you send me the deal, I'll look at it, I'll give you the feedback, I'll give you suggestions as procedures, uh, and I, hopefully I can add some value too. I mean, in a lot of cases, I mean, like I, I think I told you this story, and see, I had a prospect, you know, they were a searcher, uh, a brothers uh, that were searchers, uh, two brothers, and they, they had a deal where there was substantial dollars received in advance of the service. So in other words, it was an annual billing type of arrangement. And the thing is, when they showed me the LOI, all they had was a conventional working capital mechanism. And you know how that works. It's basically you set a peg and based on the delta, that's how purchase price is adjusted. I mean, that's that's it. That's I mean, And that's what they had. And I said, hey guys, you know, this is a company that receives so much cash in advance. When you close, the seller's gonna walk off with a lot of cash you're going to be left holding those services. You know, you're holding the bag. You're going to have to provide those services. I said, that's not, this working capital mechanism isn't going to do it, do it for you because it's only the delta. In other words, it'll only be the delta in that liability to provide the future services you're going to be entitled to. So it was so funny. Yeah, yeah, no, and I didn't hear from them. I didn't hear from them for like 90 days and I thought I'd lost the deal. You know, I thought they weren't going to work with me. And then they called me back and they said, hey, um, you know, Bill, uh, and they gave me a, a holy, uh, holy renegotiate LOI. And they said, you know, Bill, you weren't the cheapest guy in town, but you were the only person to point out this issue. You know, we appreciate it. So we're working with you. So that's that's what I like to be able to do. I like to be able to show the value that I'm going to be able to provide, you know, even before you spend your first dollar with me, is I want to show you that value. And that's what I'm going to, I'm working on that for you, Ansi, right now with the deals. Yes, so, hey, Bill, so 
real quick, a lot of us on here, um, we would really love to do a 100% seller finance deal. Now, right. let me go over right. a scenario with you, right? Since you're sure. not looking at financials that way, you know, a lot of us, we're, a lot of us, we, uh, we love the numbers. So if you say numbers, we can really get an idea of what the deal looks like. Right. Um, okay, so a deal, I think I described it to you. Uh, eight months of negative cash flow, but it was averaging three million um, last year. I'm sorry, 2019 per month mm -hmm. it was averaging three million, but sales went down to uh, you know 100,000, 110, 150,000, and it was eight months uh, negative cash flow, right? Mm -hmm. And the seller accepted a 100% uh, seller finance, you know. Uh, option with that uh we're going to take over the cash flow of course and we're going to be the bank what we're doing is right now you know mm -hmm. i think I, I think you have that deal um, yeah yeah and i haven't looked at it yet but I, i'm going to yeah no i know what you're talking about so, yeah yeah okay so that one right so yeah. what what would be an ideal structure right for something like that because what i have is 10 years 4.5 percent interest you know and the seller, we don't pay them anything until the business, you know, meets a certain um, uh, milestones, you know, if you will. Right. And right. and a, a little bit more background, um, they had they were operating with eight people, went down to two, but they're back at six. And right. the owner, he's like, he's he's just gonna keep it lean. Maybe add one more person, but he's just gonna keep it lean, you know, six seven people. Sure. Um, and he's getting back to where you know slowly where he was. It's, it's just if he sold now. He's not getting anything from anyone. It's not a financeable deal with any bank, right? right? So that's why I gave him that option, and he said yes. So what would working capital look like, right? I mean, let's say the business is operating. Um, the operating expenses for the business is, ah, let's just say 80k. That's the break even, right? right. A, 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 everything after that is, you know, um, uh, profits or whatever. What kind mm -hmm. of working capital would I be looking at, and how would I go about that, and how easy or difficult? Would it be obtaining working capital? Oh, oh, now wait a second. So you're saying their their cash flow is 80k a year? I'm going to say that again. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. So no, that's not their cash flow. That's uh um the operating expense a month. Oh, all right. That's a cash rate. Right. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. But they were averaging 300 thousand per month prior right. to COVID when COVID yeah. happened. You know, um, sure. everything uh, went down, and they had eight months of negative cash flow, not consecutive months, but. Uh, one ah. year, two months here, and then you know back and forth. So right, total right. into eight negative cash flow months. Yeah. No, and there, there so I mean, in, in determining working capital, there's all sorts of different approaches. I mean, okay. you know, one is looking at like cash conversion cycle. You know, so so uh, you know, how long does it take? You know, from from uh, paying for the for for the payroll and and so forth until you get the cash in the door. So that's one way of looking at it. And there's actually a court case. It's called the Bardo formula. Uh, where they they stepped through you know kind of the calculations um, because you know there was there's a case about working capital believe it or not so so a tax case so so there are there are structured ways of doing it you know I mean when you're talking cash burn though you know I mean you probably want to have a couple months at least on hand you know I mean if you're just burning through uh, like that I, I'll look at it I'll, I'll give you a I'll give you a, a, an opinion on that no worries but what you have to be careful of in those types of deals if you're doing no money down deals is you know, sometimes the sellers are going to push back and, gee, what kind of security do you have? I actually had a client years ago. Uh, they were a casting company, metal casting, uh, and they acquired this competitor. They thought, wow, this is going to be a wonderful product line. It was troubled, and basically it was a lease. You know, you, you pay us off, uh, you know, whatever it was, a 10-year a lease, and you, you get the company. Or it might have been less than that. It might have even been five years. Problem is there were so and they they ran they ran for it they thought it was so great they didn't do any diligence they just ran or, you know signed the agreement the problem was there was no way to make this thing profitable I mean it had been crushed by you know their their cost structure and and overseas competition had taken a lot of the work away and and they just couldn't they couldn't make the payments and and unfortunately it was secured by the assets of the company that that bought this other company and they had to they basically had to um, uh, I mean, to avoid a lawsuit, had to come to terms and pay the thing off. So, so if the seller has any type of security, you know, other than you know, say the stock of the company itself, um, you know, you got to be careful. You know what what you're putting up for security. 
um, because you know then then you're kind of stuck. So so that's one thing to think about. But as far as other aspects of seller notes, I mean, you know, of course, we'd all prefer contingencies and earnouts, but sellers don't like that, you know, because a lot of times they're subject to disputes and blah, blah, blah. But the advantage to a buyer of a seller note, though, is that you get your step up immediately for tax purposes. So if you do, if you do start making money or you have other businesses that make money that where you might be able to offset the, the deductions, you know, for that step up, it's going to be beneficial for you, you know, to do a, to do a seller note. But as I said, the first thing on seller notes on a healthy company is, you know, well, gee, you know, the bank isn't going to allow uh, you to uh, uh, pledge the stock back to the seller. I mean, the bank wants the stock. So, uh, you know, what do you have to offer? Do you have other businesses? You know, what, what do you have personally? That's what they're going to look for. So, so you got to be careful, you know, and if, but if it is just a, a effectively, you know, a troubled situation and um, it effectively becomes a, like a contingency because it's not really secured by anything, you know, I, I guess that's, you know, you really aren't going to run into trouble that way. You just have to be careful. So anyway, so that's my opinion. <laughs> so, so our, our, uh, our seller finance deals, um, is it always content? Well, is it never contingency, uh, with the seller or, Oh, is it, what do you mean never contingency? I'm sorry. No, as far as like uh, well, what you described, sellers don't like contingencies and uh, earnouts. Yeah, they don't like they like them. But remember, I, I, I said that Wall Street Journal statistics are now 50% of deals, earnouts. Yeah, so they they become big time now. Because and of COVID, because, right? So thank yeah, you. it's uncertain valuation. People don't know. Right. You know, if you're up, people don't know if you're sustainable. If you're down, you know, sellers think they're going to come back. But, you know, you don't know for sure. And the bank isn't going to fund that necessarily. You know what I mean? If the business had been down. You know, so that's the problem. So, so how likely or how many times have you seen a 100% seller finance deal go through? Not fall through, but go through. Uh, I have a client that's working on one now and, and had one go through previously. Basically, how they structured it was they um, they gave the seller preferred preferred stock, you know, that was a level above them for the full value of the business. They, they though, had all the common. So, in other words, once so did they, they get cash at closing? Uh, it was nominal. It was nominal. I, I mean, as I said, that's how they structured it, and they kind of took over the operation of the business. Now, of course, the seller had to be very confident, you know, that they were going to do do the right things with this business, you know, to be able to, I mean, to do that. But but they they're operating. I mean, it's a machinery company. They they build machinery, but that's that's basically how they structured it. They gave the seller all preferred equal to you know what the seller uh, what the agreed on value was. That would have to be paid off, you know, before before the the common would become you know, valuable, you know. So that's how they structured it. So it's it's done, you know, and people do it. Um, you know, it all it all kind of depends, you know. I mean, the only problem is in this market, it's it's going to be kind of tough because the market now is becoming frothy again. There's a lot of availability of financing. Um, there's a lot of a lot of deals going on, a lot of activity. Um, so it's going to be a little tougher, you know, to to get. To get a nice deal. I know he's working on another one similar, and there's been a lot of delays you know, because the seller is still convinced. Well, gee, maybe he can find someone, you know, to give you the give him the five x cash, you know, or whatever, you know. So it's it's a little different. So so there you are. So so uh, uh, are you saying that there's a lot of activity? I'm not sure if you could hear me well, um, but are you saying are you seeing a lot of activity in uh, M and A? Is it picking back up? Oh yeah, yeah. No, let me let me tell you a little story about that too. I mean, it, it was interesting. The last deal I did was like four days uh, before Governor Prisker shut down Illinois. It was four days before, and then as soon as that happened, it was it was like I had deals in process. Uh, there was one where the lender withdrew. There was another where the lender cut the credit facility in half. I mean, it was just a disaster, and and other deals were just delayed. You know, there there was no. There was no moving forward with them. It wasn't until June that I started seeing things happening again. But after that, you know, I, it was closing after closing. It was like there was pent up closings going on. I mean, deals that survived, they they went forward. And now it's it's like crazy. And and you see it in the stock market. I mean, the the availability of of capital and and um, you know the liquidity that's out there. You see it. So so are you seeing it's all any, um are you seeing any volatility as far as the markets in uh, 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 markets abroad, UK, you know, markets like that pertaining to M&A? Uh, what I mean by that, U.S., are we doing more deals, you know, overseas again and stuff like that? 
And let me ask you this. Um, this may not be the question for here, but is uh, our airline uh, travel travels picking back up a little bit? <laughs> Those are a huge question. No, let me let me take them though. I mean, again, from my limited middle market perspective, you know, that's all I can offer you. But but as far as um, international deals, those were really stalled. I mean, I had a deal uh, that was going for quite some time in the fall. It was a UK buyer. Um, stall, stall, stall. You know, I mean, you couldn't even travel there without quarantine. You know, it was like, you know, I mean, so the international, I really haven't seen as much as I've been seeing. And I work with um, some foreign equity groups, believe it or not. I, I one in France, um, you know, I work with uh, pretty extensively. They closed down, you know, pretty much their U.S. Uh, activity. So I don't think that's really come back yet. I, I think, I, I mean, I'm not seeing the, the level of, of foreign activity uh, that I had been seeing before. As far as airline travel, I mean, it's it's surprising, but it does seem to be coming back. I mean, I, I think they had reported like over the holiday, wasn't wasn't it? Uh, I mean, capacity was was uh, becoming limited again. I mean, so people were traveling. But I think people are still certainly conservative. I mean, I can tell you personally, I used to travel probably, I don't know, 30%. I'd be out of town, you know, and, and I, I would actually structure my trips so that I could go to various client sites, you know, diligence sites, so, like three a week without returning home in between. You know what I mean? I, I would schedule a week where I'd go from city to city where I had diligence teams working. Um, and now none of that. I mean, now it's it's just assumed it's going to be remote. You know, there, nobody even expects uh, in-person uh, interaction anymore. And I used to push for that. I used to tell people, hey, you know, I need to see it. I need to feel it. I need to touch it. I need to walk the manufacturing plant. I need to interview folks in person. And now, as I said, I mean, that is so uh, so foreign to people. I mean, talk about foreign. Right. Yeah, they don't, they so don't, there's would no you, expectation. Yeah. Would you recommend doing deals uh, without seeing them and just like Zoom conference the owner? Would you recommend not walking the facilities? Is that okay? Well, I mean, you know, as I said, I think my clients continue to do it. You know, I'm just saying as a diligence guy, I'm not doing it so much anymore. And the fortunate part about having the years in that I do is that I've seen practically everything. I can imagine what the what the operations look like. You know what I mean? I mean, if it's a manufacturer, I, I've i seen it, you know, and, and they actually now also in data rooms even post video tours of the facilities, believe it or not. So, yeah, yeah I mean, but what about you know, some of us who are more newer, haven't closed a deal yet, don't know anything about the industry per se. Yeah, well, I mean, the good news is that, you know, the medical field is a little different. You know, I mean, it's if, if you're not dealing with a manufacturer, you know, there isn't a heck of a lot of operations to see. So so that's that's the good news. But um, but no, I, I do still see people on the ground. Yeah. I mean, folks like yourselves, you know, I mean, searchers, uh, independent sponsors, uh, Equity folks are doing deals. They're they're on the ground. I mean, they're they're traveling. I am not as extensively, but they are. I mean, it has to. Be, I mean, it just seems like it has to be for for you guys. I mean, I'm different, of course. I'm I'm just doing the diligence work, but you need to de develop a nice rapport with owners and all this and that, and you know, so it's really tough to do uh, over the. So, phone. Um, as far as like due diligence, right? Um, I believe what a uh, a QOE. How long would that typically take? Right uh, to get back to us, if that's something like that we need. Again, I understand it's it depends on how extensive we may want it, and I guess it would probably depend on the size of the deal, of course, too, right? Sure. Because you're not gonna treat a two million dollar deal the same as a twenty million dollar deal for QOE. Right. right? Oh, yeah. So, uh, what kind of time frame typically are we looking at for medical deals, of course? Oh yeah, no, I'm I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> so, so the typical timeline is going to be. Um, you know, you're going to give me the materials. I'll look them over. I'll come up with a proposed set of procedures, you know, which will go through the metrics that I talked about, the areas of risk, and we'll collaboratively narrow it down to uh, the procedures that, that we think are going to be the most bang for the buck. So it's not going to be everything because everything isn't going to be cost beneficial. It's going to be narrowed down to a customized approach, no cookie cutter to the deal that, that you're doing. And then once we've determined that and, you know, when we settle on, you know, the fee quote and everything, the expectations, we would move forward with a kickoff call. And during the kickoff call with the seller, we would go through the request list. And generally they'd probably need a week or two to get, a, get things together. Now that is unless they have like QuickBooks or Sage, 
in that case, we could even remote in and run off the reports we need if they if they would allow us to do that or if they want to give us a backup copy of QuickBooks. But otherwise, generally, it's a week or two time frame. And that gives me the chance to pull in the, you know, the best senior manager, you know, the person who has the background that, that I'd want to be involved with me in the particular deal. So, so that's a good thing. But, but another thing is it establishes the initial rapport with the seller. So it's, whether it's by phone or on a Zoom, uh, it's, going to, it's going to make them comfortable. So one of the things I typically say, well, first of all, I talk about my relationship with you you know, and, and, and you know, the, how, what a great fit you are for this deal. I, I mean, they are and vice versa. Um, that's one thing that I say, but I also say, you know, I, I try to calm them down and just tell them if they, especially if they haven't been through it before that I'm not the IRS. You know, I, I, I once had a business owner that was so nervous that they called their broker and said, you know, this guy's a CPA. Isn't he ethically bound to disclose to the IRS if he finds a problem? <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, it's like, it, it was kind of funny. But, you know, so some business owners sometimes are a little nervous. So I calm them down. You know, I'm not the IRS. I'm not here to grade you. Uh, I, I, I like to work in a collaborative way. You know, I'm here to solve problems, you know. And, and so that's, that's kind of what I do at the kickoff. And then a week, a week or two later, once they've populated the data room or however we're delivered the documents, it could be through a secure portal we have or whatever, um, then we're ready to hit the ground. And by then, uh, and, and it used to be literally hitting the ground. I mean, we would go uh, obviously go into the field and, and get started. And by that point, though, we'll have looked at enough information that will be the most effective and efficient as, as we can be when we do hit the ground. So by the end of day one, I'm going to have – I'm going to know what the major issues are, or worst case, in you know, a little bit into day two, if there are big issues and what there are. And inevitably, there are big issues. And by the end of that week, uh, there would be a preliminary adjust the EBITDA schedule. So beyond that, if you need a formal report, you know, that's going to add some time. It's probably going to add a couple of weeks. But if you need anything in the meantime, any of the schedules or whatever else, I can give this to you. But because I'm with a 400 person firm, you know, one of the the nice things is that there is, you know, quality control. There's a function there. There's a processing function, but it does add time. But the good news is that when you get the report, it's an anticlimax. You already know what the issues are. You know, there, there wouldn't be. It's just kind of a, a, a time lag that's due to the quality controls of our firm, you know. And, and so when you get the report, as I said, nothing in there that um, that is going to surprise or shock you. So... In a compressed version, that's what it's like. Now, of course, there may be a lot of things that go on. I mean, there may be uh, difficulties getting information. Uh, as I said, there may be missing information. There may be going back to the seller and saying, hey, you know, maybe your accounting firm needs to help you with this or, or something like that. So there are a lot of things that may come up that may delay that timeline, but but that's the basic the basic timeline if, if all goes well. You know, that, that is kind of... Okay. And you know, also, this is... Uh, I was just going to go, um, since we're on the, the topic of the IRS slash government entities and everything, and I'm sure a lot of the new individuals to this group and to this process are going to be wondering, um, since the change in government, what do you see with new regulations going to be rolling out and um, the winds where the market's going to be shifting? So I've got a lot of insight saying that the uh, market's going to be shifting. It's just Specifically in the healthcare, um, closer to telemarketing and home health, um, right. and uh, there, there's just going to be a lot of regulation um, that a lot of the uh, um, the lower to middle market just can't swallow the, the costs, which is going to lead to a lot of the uh, mergers between the, the the massive hospitals, etc. So I would love to have your insight on that and some of the um, emerging. Uh, uh, markets and anything from HVAC to, to whatever that could be hot coming out of COVID. Wow. All right. That's a big question. <laughs> and as far as regulations, though, I think you also need to know what we have in that's, mind. Wait, um, real Go quick, um, Bill, that's that's Sam. Um, we call him Captain America, but he just came home, the United States Marine. Um, wow. Oh, about to be a captain. So uh, future president of the United States, no joke. Just to give you wow. a background. Wow. Well, <laughs> honored to meet you. Honored to meet you. And thank you for your service. So let me say that. But, but yeah, as far as, um, I mean, regulation, I think you got also got to talk about taxes too. So I'll, I'll try to hit both of those things. I mean, and as a CPA, of course, taxes are probably uh, top of mind. Um, 
I, and the thing with the stimulus is it's wonderful, but ultimately it has to be paid for. You can't just sustain uh, deficits. You know, I mean, it, it just isn't going to work. It is going to have to be paid for. And, and our new president has been very clear about who's going to pay and how. And one of the changes that would radically affect deals would be um, the increase in the double tax rate on C corporations. Because up till now, I mean, starting, you know, especially with the 2017 Tax Act, C corporations became very popular because basically the double tax was reduced pretty much to almost equal the individual ordinary tax rate. It's about 39%, 39.8 on the C corporation double tax. So, so if that's the worst case, in owning a C-Corp, people would go for it because the best case is you only pay 21% and then under Section 1202, as long as you check some boxes like the right industry, the right hold period, stock deal at the end, pay zero on your gain as, as a small deal. So so it was a wow. You know, I had people uh, that were starting up, um, you know, their, their holding companies as C-Corps, you know, to, to take care, I mean, to take advantage of, of those provisions and the low tax rates. Now, what the new administration, though, has made very clear is that, uh, for one thing, they're going to increase corporate tax rates, but only halfway to where they were. So it, it had been 35, went down to 21, now it's going to go to 28. So that's that part, okay, you know, that's fine. Uh, however, you know, if you calculate that out, that will be like an immediate 10% decline in value of companies that are paying 21 versus 28. So that's everybody on the stock market. You know, that's like a 10% valuation um, if you're valuing valuing uh, your stock portfolio on a uh, PE ratio, uh, bang, you know, 10% gone. Okay, so that's one thing. But even worse than that for the middle market people that are trying to do C corporations is that the double tax rate, which is basically the the rate on ordinary dividends and I'm qualifying ordinary dividends and capital gains, instead of 20%, it's now going to go up to the new individual rate, which is really the, you know, going back to the old rate, which is 39.6. And if you do that and you recalculate the double tax, you're at almost 60%. And that's just on federal, you know, so it's like a majority of your dollars are, is gone. You know, if, if you're, if you're exiting your business, a majority of your dollar is no longer yours. So that could have a massive effect on entities and, you know, just kind of the whole thought of, um, of going forward. And I've written articles on that, which I've tortured ANSI with, you know, so if you want to see those, um, I'm happy to send them. So that's, that's the tax side. As far as regulation goes, I'm not sensing um, really uh, pending doom. I mean, I've done so many healthcare deals now, and it's such a hot, hot space. So for example, I, I helped a, uh, a company do a roll-up of dental offices, and it, it was announced, it's an announced transaction, so I can't even say who it was. It was True Dental, it was in Southfield, Michigan. They built like a portfolio of, I don't know, probably 30 dental locations they did through a roll-up. And I was with them from the beginning, did all their auto work, all their tax work, and then also did a sell side QB. They wound up selling the KKR. I can't tell you what the number is, but it was astronomical. So they they really were an overnight sensation after five years. So that worked out very well. Um, in addition, though, I'm working on a healthcare SPAC right now where that we're rolling up substance abuse, we're rolling up uh, behavioral health, we're rolling up compounding pharmacies, um, and that is already raised 280 million already committed to the SPAC. So. Um, I'm seeing everything hot about healthcare, you know, so I'm not seeing um, uh, any any pending doom or slowdown there. Uh, so, I mean, as far as regulations, um, I think one of the worries originally was, well, you know, what would what would the Trump administration do with Obamacare and what would they monkey with here? And what kind of uncertainty there would be? And obviously, you know, now that the administration's changed as well as, you know, Congress is now is now blue, um, you know, pretty much. Uh, uh, you don't have that type of concern anymore. So I'm not seeing a lot of um, slowdown. I, I, I'm seeing quite the contrary. I'm seeing a lot of deals and a lot of money uh, uh, flying around, you know, for these deals. So, so, and again, I'm not, I guess maybe I'm, I'm not as focused. I mean, there was something that actually, though, came up on substance abuse, which was interesting. And it even affected, I have a nonprofit. I, I, uh, I service uh, here in Chicago called, um, a McDermott Center. They're they're like a thirty million dollar nonprofit that do uh, detox um, and and uh, in you know substance abuse treatment, and it's nonprofit. Um, they had the same problem as this. Basically, what happened was 
and this can happen at any time, the, the, uh, the funding sources, you know, your, your insurance companies, certain of them change their reimbursement model. What they had been doing for substance abuse was they would pay you for each test you did, you know, so you'd have your own test lab and everything. And, and you'd be able to bill them every time you went in and did a test on one of these, these folks. Uh, they switched it to be being part of the pure BM rate and basically cut the even down company uh, before my client bought it from, you know, whatever, 18 million EBITDA down to like five, you know, it was like, bang, you know, so there's always, whenever you have a, a um, whenever you're dependent on payer sources, there's always a risk that they're going to change how they do things. And, and that's basically what happened in that industry was suddenly, you know, people decided, well, that's part of your per diem rate. We're not going to pay you for that separately anymore. And all of a sudden this, this huge profit center they had is just bang, you know, it's gone. So, so there are always, you know, those types of things. But as far as specific regulations, I, I'm not seeing any that, uh, you know, that are affecting, um, you know, the deals I'm working on right now. And I mean, maybe you could clarify what type of stuff you had in mind, because I might have heard of, of some of it. If you're still it was there. just regarding the, uh, the, the payments with Medicare and Medicaid um, and the uh, re-up of, of the Affordable Care Act uh, and how that was going to impact the, uh, the market, because... The way it was explained to me was that basically, I, I know that healthcare primarily relies on Medicare and Medicaid and it takes up about 35% of the revenues of hospitals. And then you have basically service based on operations and then uh, depending on if it's an assistant home, et cetera, but with how that payment was being handled and then um, hospitals not getting reimbursed and having to work at a, a deficit as compared to being or giving or getting um, insurance money from like Cobra, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, stuff like that. Oh, interesting. Because, you know, the nonprofit uh, that I deal with had a huge problem opposite way with Obamacare. Mm -hmm. Suddenly these indigents, you know, of course, they're bringing in people that are homeless and everything. You know, they're nonprofit. That's who they're treating. They're picking people up off the street. But the thing is, a problem they had was kind of the opposite problem, which was because they now these people theoretically qualified under Obamacare, they weren't getting the grant money anymore. You know, it was like, OK, well, you're supposed to go out and get private insurance and, and, and just think about, you know, you need a Social Security number and stuff. <laughs> you know, you need to kind of have your ducks in a row to get get that insurance. So they were having trouble, you know, even even getting reimbursement. You know, I mean, it was like all of a sudden the grant money that was there. They're telling them go to private insurance for this and, you know, to try to get private insurance with people that don't even have an ID. You know, it's like it didn't really work very well. But no, that's an interesting one. I mean, and and I'll, I'll see, you know, again, I'll, I'll see what more I can find out about that. But haven't seen it on my deals right now. You know, I just haven't haven't seen that as a major issue. But that's a, that's an interesting, interesting thought. And, I, and I'll pursue that. You bet. So. Hey, Bill, I got a couple questions that the people have asked if I can run through them. Sure. First thing I want to uh, ask you, how do you figure out what's the true bottom line numbers of the business? Essentially, the free cash flow, you know, an encumbered free cash flow that is not pledged to anything. Right. Oh, I guess I guess he's asking what the unlevered cash flow is, right? Yeah, essentially, you know, what's, what's right. not uh, pledged oh, yeah. to anything, what's clean, the bottom line. No, that, that's very interesting because, um, you know, it's interesting you bring up the concept of free cash flow because I've encountered before uh, situations, for example, the, the one that I was talking about a minute ago, the, the company or a few minutes ago, the company that is doing those medical implants and they had those fixed assets. I said, hey, you know, we can avoid a conflict with the seller about their accounting practice of classifying resale items as fixed assets and avoiding charging them against EBITDA by switching to a free cash flow concept, you know, where you deduct the CapEx. So I've used it in those situations or for rental businesses, you know, I brought it in. I said, you know, that isn't even da. You know, you need to you need to bring in the the CapEx component. But on a typical medical deal, you're not going to see, you know, fixed assets being that big a deal, you know, the CapEx. I mean in theory, you are supposed to determine what it re what's required to maintain, you know, the the assets and, and do that deduct to come down to free cash flow. But as I said, a lot of times people don't take that step because they're already dealing in, in particular industries where that's kind of reflected in the in the multiple that you expect to pay for that industry. So so not seeing that. But as far as coming down to the number, 
I can, I can, you know, I've done, I, I've done articles on diligence. I've done speeches on diligence. It's, um, and, and the thing about diligence is, you know, it's kind of like one of those things you don't want to try at home because it, I, I mean, if you think about, um, what it takes to become an auditor and, and when I think about, you know, my early years as an auditor and how clueless I was, you know, and, and, and how it took, I mean, it really takes, it takes a period of time to develop those skills. And, and for that reason, that's why private equity funds come to me. I mean, they're all Harvard MBAs, Stanford, you know, all, you know, schools that you, you, you know, sometimes schools you've never heard of, you know, like Harvard, but, and Kellogg, and, you know, of course I have to mention Kellogg. Um, but they're, they're, they admit that there are things that they can't do, and that is the forensic investigation that goes into coming out to what the true numbers are. They admit they can't do that. They can do financial modeling all day long. You know, I mean, they can run circles around people on financial modeling. Um, but as far as, you know, when it comes down to looking at the financials, finding the issues, they admit that that's not their expertise and it shouldn't be. I mean, you guys are good at what you're good at. You know, you're good at running businesses. You're good at being entrepreneurs. I mean, that's, that's what you guys are good at. You have to delegate, you know, to other specialists some of these areas, you know, like, like diligence. I mean, that's, that's one of the things. So, so I'm happy to send you articles and everything to explain better what it is. Um, but I, 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 you know, I can't really, I don't know. It's very difficult to encapsulate in, in yeah. uh, you know, a short webinar, of course. So, so <laughs> let me ask you this. So we're looking at financing these deals using the cash flow of the business, the books, right? Uh, with yeah. banks, we're looking at cash flow based loans. So what would the bank consider to be cash flow? to cover that debt service, essentially? What do they look at? Oh, there, there are a number of ratios. And here's the good news, though. If you're doing SBA, those ratios are optional because the SBA doesn't have covenants. But banks have typically will have covenants. I mean, if they're asset-based, the covenants are less. If, if they're cash flow-based, the covenants are more. So, so a couple of the basic ones, one is tangible net worth. So in other words, they're going to look at you know, once you subtract your goodwill asset that's out there, because that's an intangible, how much equity is really there? You know, how much is left? And they will set covenants based on maintaining that. And that will prevent you from, you know, distributing or, or losing money or whatever else. Um, you know, that's that's one of their controls. Another control is going to be fixed cover ratio, which is going to look at your debt service. You know, in other words, how much cash flow do you have to cover debt service? Another another element um, that I always look at, but it's not something that's formally written in the bank documents usually, is just how much is the senior debt to EBITDA, you know, and, and I will look at that when I'm, when as part of the metrics I'm going to send you and see on your deals, uh, I will look at that just to measure what the asset borrowing capacity is of the targets that you're looking at. So. If you're in a, in a larger space, you might get up to like a 3x uh, EBITDA senior, you know, smaller deals, you know, might be more like, you know, one and a half or, or two. But um, that is another limit that, that you'd want to look at. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I actually have three that are built into the metrics that I'm going to send you, Nancy, uh, you know, that you can apply to the deal. But but that that's basically the idea. You know, they, they, they just want to set limits as far as when they can come in and and uh, and and uh, and say time out, hey, you know, now you're in earn in, in workout, you know what I mean, type of thing. That's that's what they're doing. They're trying to protect themselves, so they will spike out uh, based on the projections you give them. So you don't want to be overly, you know, optimistic. Um, they will spike out what they expect as far as your performance, and it's reviewed quarterly, generally, you know. So, yeah. So my question regarding EBITDA, as I know, is EBITDA is earnings before interest, depreciation, amortization, and taxes, right? So let's assume yes. a company has $1 million in EBITDA, and I'm looking to buy it at a four times, okay? So that's right. $4 million, right? right. If I was right. to take that to a bank and get it financed uh, on the cash flow, on the EBITDA, uh, mm -hmm. would they take the whole million dollars EBITDA to cover the debt service, or would they subtract the interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization from that? Uh, yeah, no, no, that, no, that's a great question. I mean, basically the bank would look at it a little differently, you know, as I said, generally probably two X for senior, you know, is, is, is the rule of thumb and maybe another turn if you have mes coming in, but you know, generally like two X your EBITDA, so that'd be $2 million. I mean, basically they are looking at, you're right there, there is more or less when you're talking about cash flow coverage. You're looking at the bottom, bottom line versus uh, versus debt service, and debt service includes principal. 
you know, so it's not only interest, it's also principal. So it, it, depending on how it amortizes, it could be very tight, you know, so, and that's one of the advantages of an SBA loan, uh, other than tying up all your personal assets, you know, uh, specifically attaching is you get a 10 year amortization. You know, you really can't beat that for an unsecured acquisition loan. Generally banks won't give you any more than like three, four years. I mean, it's, it's just not, I mean, the 10 years is something unique to that. But, but that's how you look at it. It's going to be like a, a 2X EBITDA is what your debt load is going to be. Yeah, they're, they're not going to, they will generally, you're right, you're going to subtract out what your actual CapEx is, you know, so, so there are balance sheet items that will come out of that EBITDA. They're not, they're not going to look at it like, you know, strictly like that. So, okay, so no, that's, my question is from that EBITDA, can you use the interest taxes, depreciation, amortization to cover debt as well? Or is that subtracted with anything else? Oh, yeah. No, no. I mean, uh, in, it's, instead of depreciation and amortization, they're going to subtract CapEx, you know, and, and then as far as they're not going to do anything with interest, but they're going to compare the result to interest and principal that payments that, that are due and also fixed rental payments, you know, a lot of times they'll, they'll weigh in there too. So, yeah, there are very specific covenants that, that will limit you and it varies by bank ultimately. But again, I've got articles on financing, you know, where I, where I go through those metrics. I'm happy to share them. I mean, here, here's the thing about me. You know, I, I love to add value to clients. So over the years, I mean, since 1991, I've been writing for 2,000 words a month for a trade magazine. So I've written about practically everything you're asking me about, 2,000 words each, <laughs> probably multiple times over over since 1991. So so I'd love to. I mean, and, 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 you know, the biggest reason I do it is because I will get questions, you know, like these, and I will try to answer them uh you know, and after 10 seconds, 20 seconds, people are sick of listening to me and, and that's it. And they'll take that as an answer. But the answer is really more like 2000 words, even to scratch the surface on these topics. So that's why I do it. You know, when, when questions come up like this, I'll say, Hey, you know, something, I wrote an article on this, I'll send it to you. And then when you, you know, once you've gone through it, you know, we can go through more specific questions you're going to have, you know, when you're done with that. So yeah. that's kind of how, how I find it you know, to be an effective advisor to people. This right. is the right, you know. So in regards to, for example, if I was to do a, a stock purchase of a company, right? From what I know, mm -hmm. assets would come with the company because anything that is used to generate the cash flow, the revenue of the business comes with the purchase of the stock, essentially. Because I've seen mm -hmm. these brokers list inventory and equipment, <coughs> essentially FF&E, &E, <laughs> As, as double so is that double pain or do we subtract that oh that's funny that's funny no and, and again I, I think I even have written articles where I address those types of issues but but let, let me tell you um, you are entirely 100% correct if you're paying an EBITDA multiple it's supposed to include all the operating assets of the business less the operating liabilities like accounts payable you know that's that's what it's supposed to be so that's going to be your your receivables your inventory it's going to be any fixed assets that are used in the business, not the real estate, though, unless it's specialized and, you know, it's doubtful. You know, I mean, I'm talking about like processing plants where the whole plan is built around the process. It's doubtful you're going to get involved in those deals because those are larger, larger, uh, larger numbers you're talking about. But operating assets would be things like machinery, equipment and a manufacturer. Those things have to be included, you know, minus the accounts payable that is included. So. Not cash, you know, not debt, of course. I mean, all that has to be paid off, even in a stock deal. I mean, people aren't, I mean, lenders generally just don't let buyers come in and assume debt. So all that has to be paid off, all the cash goes to the seller, and, and how you control that is a working capital mechanism, you know, from LOI to close, there's a peg set. But but the thing, uh, the thing is that, yes, I find in the smaller deal of brokers, they'll say, well, the seller wants to keep the receivables, yeah, or the, you know, whatever. The seller wants to keep this or that. I mean, if they, they're they free to do that, but then that gets deducted out of the value you're paying. You know, you're paying a base on a multiple. Your multiple assumes, you know, that these items are included. That's just how valuation works. You have to get, and that's why there is a working capital mechanism to begin with, because you need the working capital to, to survive as a business. So you're going to need, you know, those receivables that are going to be coming in to fund your current operations. You know, otherwise you're going to have a working capital crunch right from the get-go because, you're going to have to pay suppliers and you're going to be waiting for uh, brand new receivables to come in. So, so it's all part of the valuation. You're absolutely right. And, and I've helped uh, clients push back on brokers that, that take that approach because it's incorrect. It just isn't correct. And if, 
if they want to do it, they can do it, but then you got to deduct it from what you're paying. And then you also have to worry about is the seller going to strong arm these customers, you know, to, uh, to collect from them, piss them off, and then they won't want to deal with you anymore. So that's another thing you have to worry about. You got to control the collections. If, if they really insist on taking those receivables, you got to control the collections. But to me, uh, you know, kind of like you said, I, you know, not to disparage anyone, but it's almost like a grab for additional purchase price, you know, that they're really not entitled to, uh, you know, I'm sorry. Yeah. And I would never say that you know, directly to anybody, of course, but, um, but that's the feeling I have when I'm negotiating things like that for yeah, people. Yeah, that's what it is. Now, let me ask you this. If I was to do a stock purchase, do I keep anything that's in the bank account? Uh, no. <laughs> I don't care what kind of deal you do. You, you generally have to pay off the debt and you give the seller the cash. Yeah, that's no. I mean, uh, they, they basically distribute it out of the company is what happens. Yeah, at closing. Oh, that's I mean, Yeah. Well, let me ask yeah. you this. I mean, but here's the thing. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing, though. I mean, I want to. I let me amend that, though, because if there are substantial deposits involved, like like that example I gave early on of, of the guys that I helped, um, you know, with their LOI, redo the, their LOI to accommodate the fact that the seller was walking off with cash and they were left holding the bag of the services. There should be cash left behind to cover things like that, you know. So, in other words, if there are customer advance deposits in the, in the company you're looking at, there should be cash left behind by the seller to do that. That doesn't mean it's going to equal the bank account. You know, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's not going to equal. But um, but they should leave cash for that. Yes. Yeah. So go ahead. Okay, so retain earnings and how does it come into play with the business, the financials? You know, retained earnings is nothing but accumulated earnings minus distributions from inception. That's all it is. Um, you know, you don't buy or sell retained earnings. It's, it's basically, uh, you know, an account on the balance sheet. It's really the balancing account that, that represents the cumulative amount of everything. And, and, you know, so typically in diligence, one of the procedures is to make sure it's called roll. This, this equity roll is, is, the, is the vernacular of accounting. Uh, and what that means is, uh, do things balance? So in other words, if I, if I start with the beginning retained earnings and I add in the activity that they're presenting, you know, on their income statement, do I come up with the number they show on the balance sheet at the end? Because if they're not, I mean, if it doesn't equal, they could be hiding things. They could be, you know, posting debits, which are like expenses to retain earnings, trying to hide them off their income statement. You know, so it's like a critical, critical thing that these things um, carry through. And some of the things I've caught, you know, by trying to reconcile retained earnings is things like uh, when suddenly they were they were all along on cash basis and suddenly they report receivables. And believe it or not, some people try to put that entry, you know, and of course, it's a one time pickup. They try to put it through revenue for the year they're presenting. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, I'm sure it makes that year look good, but it's not legitimate. And you're going to find it if you try to reconcile retained earnings and you find out, whoa, you know, they didn't adjust retained earnings for the opening. Uh, number you know i mean they they put it all in the current period so so it'll disclose things for you you know i mean it'll disclose um you know badness in the numbers and and again you're you're not going to become an expert at it by talking to me this is something you do you know it's by doing and you got to commit your career to it like i did you know i mean it's not something I, you know I, as i said don't try this at home uh but you shouldn't you shouldn't you shouldn't want to because you're good at what you're good at you know you need to uh you need to um you know, make hay with the skills you have, you know, that's, and, and, and share those with the world, you know, and, and be proud of what you're doing, you know, and, and don't try to be everything because so you're not going to be, yeah, you're not going to be everything. So, so Bill, essentially but anyway. we should focus on getting the deals, negotiating the deals, getting those financials and you guys take care of that part of the diligence, right? Exactly. You know, we're going to tie down the numbers for you and right or wrong, good or bad, you know, you're going to know what, what they are. And, and it needs to be done. I mean, frankly, as I said, 99% of the deals that I've worked on, there are major issues. And it doesn't matter if they're audited or, or you know, a shoebox, you know, that was given to their attached repair. It doesn't matter. 99% of the time, there are big issues, you know, that, that diligence discloses. And okay. those well, can affect your deal. And, you know, and, and even if you don't renegotiate the deal, it'll, it'll affect your perception of, you know, your, your, you know, the multiple you're actually paying, you know, et cetera. And, and some of it could be as easy as, Overstated ad backs, you know, people getting aggressive, you know, with their ad backs. And, and, you know, once we vet those out, we'll let you know what kind of issues there are with those ad backs. So, 
Yeah, yeah. The, the thing I realized why a lot of people are trying to also learn this side, not just focusing on getting the deals, but trying to analyze them themselves, is because um, maybe it's a, this is a misconception, but they don't want to bring deals to an accounting firm, a law firm, and then ruin their perception that the only deals they bring are bad because they weren't able to do a preliminary themselves, or they're going to rack up uh, fees by having these firms taking a look at it. Well, you know, and, and here's the thing. I mean, as I said, I'm happy to look at for you guys, you know, deals on a non-charge basis, give you my feedback. And if it leads to, you know, the next step, you know, I'm here for you. Um, but, you know, the difficulty is, I mean, the other side of that is you don't want to step into a deal that's terrible. You know, you don't want to assemble all the troops and, you know, and, and get your friends and family to, uh, to put in the dollars and your investors and your banker. And then have the thing blow up. And I've seen that happen. And, and I wasn't involved in the diligence, fortunately, but I've seen it happen to people. You know, they, they buy the wrong thing and they unknowingly. And, and, it, and sometimes it is misrepresentation and fraud. Uh, let me give you an example. I mean, there was a company, uh, you know, a real small company. What they did was they would fill up cylinders, you know, I mean, basically gas cylinders. They repair them and they refill them. And they had a major customer that was like 30% of the business. And, you know, simple little business, you know, this guy was uh, going in there buying them. Uh, he thought he was going to build a portfolio of little companies, and he thought this was a great starting point. Didn't need diligence, didn't want to spend the money. Um, you know, one thing, you know, he, he did chat with me a little bit, and I just said, well, you know, that major customer, is there a contract in place, you know? And he said, oh, well, he asked the seller about that. What the seller said was, you don't need a contract. You know, we've been doing this for 20 years. You know, we just go out there once a week. We pick up, we drop off. You know, everything's fine. You don't have to worry about it. Well, it turns out, post-closing, he found out uh, that this major customer not only was no longer a customer, but had been lost months before, you know, and, and he was unable to, without their business to even continue. I mean, he, he tried to go on for a couple of months, but, you know, he ran out of money and he, he saw it as hopeless and he had to shut down. And, of course, he had recourse against the seller. He could He could do a lawsuit, but at that point, Unfortunately, if you've ever been through litigation, you know, the only winners really are the attorneys. I hate to say it, but, you know, you're not going to win even when you do win. I, I mean, with the time, the effort, the aggravation, you know, the fees, the, you know, just the misery, it's, it's like it's not worth it. You don't want to get into a bad deal, you know, a bad situation. And, and that was something that could have been avoided, you know, and, and it's just that he was an experience. He didn't know what to do, you know, and he just kind of fell into it. And the seller was intentionally deceiving him, you know, and that happens, you know, it's money, you know, I mean, we're talking about money. I mean, if you guys have bought a house, you know, you know how sellers can build up their, you know, their homes and then you have the inspector and then suddenly you find out, well, gee, you know, looks like the roof's been, you know, needs repair or whatever, you know, or the basement leaks and they didn't disclose any of this, you know, so, so that's the type of thing. I mean, people are naturally going to be motivated to uh, highlight the positives and, 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 um, and hold down the negatives. And unfortunately, too, there are just so many accounting tools of the trade that can be used to do that, that, um, that unless you're familiar with what goes on, you're, you're not going to find these things. I mean, they're going to be hidden from you. And, and I know that, just, I mean, one of, one of the advantages that I bring is um, in the early 90s, I don't know if you heard of activity-based costing, but the first book that I wrote, uh, it was on summers uh, for being an audit manager. I would spend the summers running around to manufacturing companies and doing diagnostics, you know, we charge them whatever, you know, I don't know, a thousand bucks or whatever, and just do a, a diagnostic for them. You know, what's wrong with your, your cost accounting system. And the way I got more projects was finding the deficiency. So I became very good at that. I mean, I could quickly size up uh, where the deficiencies or distortions are in cost accounting systems. I had to, I mean, that's kind of how, how I survived as a consultant during those summers with activity-based costing. Um, was doing that and that's really served me well when I go into manufacturing companies or even when I'm going into contractors or even service businesses where they may have some type of semblance of you know like labor tracking and and, uh, and that type of accounting because I know what the issues are you know I mean I, I looked at them you know with a consulting hat you know not not just a an audit hat but a consulting hat where are the distortions what can occur so, you know, I mean, I, I can quickly size these things up. Yeah. So yeah. let me let me ask you this just, you know, to be direct. That's what the people sure. want to know, especially those who are starting out. Right. As you know, it's a numbers game. 
COVID affected right. a lot of businesses. So it's, it's even more of the numbers. What we want to know is, can we reach out to you with a set of financials? You could take a look at it and from there see if it's worth moving forward with or not at no cost, essentially. You know, just take a yes. look at it. Is there something we could work on or trash it? Move on. To I guess no, no. I guess the short answer is yes. I mean, but here's here's the answer. So, in other words, it's going to be limited to what I do. As I said, I'm happy to look at your LOI, uh, your 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 deal, you know, and, and run the metrics, come up with procedures, talk to you about it. But um, and I will be brutally honest with what I find. But I, it's all up to you, you know. And again, I wouldn't have done enough usually. I mean, probably most of the time, I wouldn't have done enough to definitely say no. But I can at least bring to your attention potential issues you might not have been aware of. You know, like for example, the inventory is four times what industry uh, should show should be. You know, that type of thing. Yeah, yeah. And I can tell you what that. You know, what does that mean? Well, that means, you know, why don't you look at inventory? Because at some point. That must have been overstated, you know, I mean, and it would have been affected the EBITDA, you know, I mean, an overstatement affects EBITDA. That's, that, this is one of the things you learn, the first things you learn as an auditor is to focus on the balance sheet because the balance sheet hides all the cumulative, uh, uh, you know, tricks and trades that are done with EBITDA. You know, it, it kind of, it, it's all there. Anything, all these misstatements, you know, that have occurred cumulatively affect the balance sheet. So. If you can, if you can analyze those numbers, you're going to find a lot. So, but as I said, that's that's what I can do. I, I wouldn't have, I, I I can't say that I'm going to do enough work to tell you definitely don't do the deal. But at least I can bring you know issues to your attention you might not have been aware of, and you know so you can you know operate to that degree with a little more um, you know knowledge to what the accounting issues are. Mm -hmm. you know than, than you would have otherwise because it's tough if you're if you don't specialize in this it's it's like it's it's nuts you know i mean i, I have clients that just get cross-eyed looking at the stuff i look at all day so <laughs> yeah i understand no i feel yeah. the pain i i understand and i can't do what you do either you know i wouldn't step in your shoes and you know uh and be an entrepreneur you know uh, an eta that's not what i do you know i mean that's not what i'm good at so um, I stick to my knitting, you know, and, and I'm the specialist to, that, that you can count on to do that side of it, you know, so that's why I am. Great. Bill, so. just to close on two last things, because a lot of these questions are becoming redundant, is uh, okay. for us to move forward with you, work with you, would this be in a pre-LOI or post-LOI stage? And what what information you need for you to take a look at it essentially so we could bring you complete information? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. And it kind of depends on your preference. You know, I have, you know, like private equity funds I deal with, you know, generally will, will show me things post LOI, you know, and that's when they'll bring me in. In other words, um, you know, you should be pretty serious about something, you know, I mean, that you're really, you know, that you feel good about it or whatever, you know, and then, and then you could, you could pre present it to me. I mean, I'm happy to look at it at any stage, but I guess I just prefer that you, bring me something that you're pretty serious about. You know, maybe you haven't signed an LOI yet and you want to talk to me first. That's fine. But I prefer that. But what I would look at would be, I mean, a SIM, if there is any SIM out there, would be useful. Um, if you do any write-up for your investors, you know, that would be nice too. But the basics would be, uh, for the most recent year end, it would be the tax returns if I can get them. But definitely, if there's any financial statement that's prepared externally by an accounting from like a compilation review audit, I'd love to see that for the most recent year end. If not, just year end numbers. And then the most recent interims. So so those would be the things. And then the LOI or the draft LOI that you're thinking of submitting. So so those elements would, yeah. would be what I How far back do you need the financials? No, no, it'd just be the most recent year end and the and the most recent interims and i guess now that we just you know ended a year probably two years worth so i'd look at 20 and 19. so essentially right. the profit and loss statements month by month and balance sheet for 19 uh and 20 if you could get them, month by month, if you, if you could get them to be month by month that would be even better but i i'll i'll deal with whatever you can get me and it would be both balance sheet and pnl yeah and, okay. and it would be it could just be for the annual periods if you want but if you got a monthly i mean you know I'm an information junkie. You know, the more information, the better. <laughs> of course. Uh, oh no, I, I love being inundated. If, when I get into yeah. diligence, I, I mean, whatever I can get my hands on, and and people, you know, it's funny. Sometimes people think um, that that they can uh, sandbag me with, you know, piles of stuff, and I just thrive on it. You know, I mean, I I, I mean that is really 
the key, you know, to, I mean, having the information floodgates open is the key to, key to finding what I find, you know, I mean, and so the more, the better, yeah, believe me, bring so it on. We got, we got taxes in there, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Taxes too. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, the tax return, uh, would be good if they, if they provide it. Sometimes they're a little hesitant to do that pre LOI, but, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that'd be good. Well, that'd be all. Hey, hey Bill. Uh, hey, hold on real quick. Last question, Bill. Uh, sure. I, don't, I don't know if you can um, answer this, but, um, as far as, uh, taxes, how can we, uh, how can we avoid, <laughs> you know, oh. much taxes after these acquisitions? <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, wait, wait! Uh, you, oh, you mean the fees? My fees? You mean you think I actually no, charge no, guys? No, not, not <laughs> your fees. No, no, I'm not worried about your fees. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, the taxes. So, so the taxes. I think you mentioned something about a seller avoid, uh, avoid it. Oh yeah, yeah. No, that's a huge thing, and it's been around. There's been a hundred percent exemption, and I'll send you my article. Anybody who you know, if you write to me in the next five minutes, no, I'm kidding you. Just, just uh, link with me and tell me what that you want the article, and I'll send it to you. I mean, give me your email address. You can just look me up on LinkedIn or send it to us. Send it to us. Uh, where can we, we can post it? Where, 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 yeah, no, yeah, I can. Where, where can we find you? Uh, where can everyone find you, Bill? Uh, yeah, I mean, just you can give them my email address. It's just B Worsema. It's not the easiest name to spell, but it's B Worsema Miller Cooper. If you look up the Miller Cooper website and look me up, you'll find the email address there too. But and otherwise, I just mind, look just, up on LinkedIn. Just, LinkedIn. Just, let me spell the last name. It's not yeah, an easy yeah. one. Ready? It's W I E R S E M A. So B Worsema at Miller Cooper. Miller Cooper is all one word. It's Miller Cooper run together.com. You know, so that's my email address. And otherwise just look me up and, and you'll, you'll recognize me. If you see me on video now, I, I have my, my and, 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 and for the individuals who bring you a deal um, that they're serious about moving forward on, you know, they have you uh, look at it. In any event, they end up, you know, moving forward with you. Um, you end up doing the QOE or whatever. Um, are you able to, uh, if they don't have a uh, uh, bank that they're working with primarily, are you able to, you know, uh, help find, uh, help obtain the financing? Do you have banks that you work with? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's no, no issue there. I mean, I actually, I brought in SBA lenders, you know, I, I mean, in conventional banks, whatever. Yeah. I mean, I'm there. Yeah. I've got, I've got, I've got referrals. Believe me. Yeah. No Bill worries with that. Guy. I appreciate this so much, Bill. Sure. Thank you for your And time. you didn't, you didn't Thank let you. me finish on the tax though. Let me just do the okay, tax yeah, real yeah, quick. On the tax. <laughs> it's called, yeah, no, it's called code section 1202. And for a while there, it was, you know, just a percentage of the game was exam, blah, blah, blah. And there's rules, but you know, these lower middle market deals inevitably fit in there. As long as it's under 50 million capitalization, which, you know, these deals are, you get uh, the greater of uh, 10X or 10, or, or the lesser of uh, limited 10 million or 10X gain. So uh, free, I mean, basically tax exempt, but there are boxes to check. For one thing, there are certain industries excluded. So you can't buy an accounting firm and do this, unfortunately. Um, for another, uh, you have to hold for five years. So you can't just run in, run out. But the other thing is it has to be originally issued C-Corp stocks. So you have to be a C-Corporation. And remember, I just told you that, you know, President Biden's thoughts on taxes may result in a massive increase in the double tax in C-Corp. So this would be the only saving thing about C-Corps is if you're able to do this. And then the last thing is it has to be a stock deal. And as you know, you know, that means that the buyer takes on your liabilities. They basically step into your shoes on tax, tax return filings. They step into your shoes you know, for any liabilities that are out there, any skeletons in the closet, any litigation, they're stepping into that. And so a lot of times uh, it's a little tougher to do a stock deal than an asset deal, but that's required. You know, so if you check all those boxes, you, you exempt your gain. You know, that's what you do. So it, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, if you can check the boxes and I actually have had clients that have wanted to convert to a C corporation because they think they're going to be able to check all those boxes in five years. So it's happened, but I think what's really going to discourage it now, though, is that increased 20 points in the in the double tax. You know, it was under 40. Now it's just under 60 if if the new buying plan gets through. Again, no guarantees it's going to go through that way. And and the and the second level of tax, I should point out though, too, only affects people in years that their income's over a million dollars. Now the problem is, if you're selling a business, your income's probably going to be over a million dollars in that year. So that's the difficulty. 
But once it's over a million, you no longer get the capital gains break. You no longer get the 20%. You're now paying 39.6%, you know, like double. And so when you couple that in with the increase in corporate tax rates, it's going to be a 60% double tax just for federal. You know, that's before you even pay, pay the state you're in. So big, big uh, change potentially here coming up with C corporations. So that is really the only thing that's left. It's called Code Section 1202. You know, you can Google it. Um, uh, is is that is that tax exempt uh, gain? Is, is really the only thing that C corporations have because you can't get it any any through any other structure like an S corp or an LLC. Can't do it there. It has to be a C corporation, regular corp. So anyway, so I'll shut up now. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, Bill, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. So as you know, some of us right here are not actually in the U.S. So I'm currently looking for deals in doing exact same thing in the uk so what has been your expertise specifically in the uk now how does things look like with brexit and right. specifically the healthcare field if you have yeah any you know and i haven't been i haven't done a recently i've done a number of deals so in europe I, I was doing traveling there you know a few years ago um yeah and it's so cool when i i work in europe i love it i mean the first thing i notice is how much more advanced they are you know as far as uh banking relationships so as you know I mean, it's so funny. I have clients, for example, that are Swiss owned that were trying to implement software here at their U.S. subsidiary. And the biggest problem they had was uh, accounting for checks, you know, because there are no checks there. And that's been the case for, you know, like, I don't know, more than 10 years. I mean, and not only that, the chip in the credit card, they had that way before. My credit card wouldn't even work over there, you know, to buy, <laughs> to buy uh, you know, train tickets from a machine. Um, uh, you know, so very advanced in that, res in that regard. You know, everything is going through the banks and and the banks even post your receipts for you, you know, if, if you're set up for that. So, so you know, electronic payments, everything tra traceable. So, you know, different kind of feel to, to companies over there. Um, you know, and then also, I mean, the other part of it is that I'm, I, my firm, Miller Cooper, is part of an uh, affiliation called Nexia. So um, I don't know if you're familiar with, um, there's a firm called, is it Williams? Oh. Uh, I mean, I'm working with them now in Ireland. I, I, I need to look up their name, but they're an affiliate of ours, uh, an XE affiliate. So I could even hook you up with them, you know, like for local tax compliance, because my firm has two international tax partners. But as far as the peculiarities of some of the local things, you know, like VAT tax and dealing with the local authorities, we have firms on the ground that can help you, you know, that are part of the NXE affiliates. It's Smith Williamson is the name of the firm. Mm -hmm. um, we've got affiliates on the ground that can help you but as i said Absolutely, i've done a lot yeah. of travel i've done a lot of travel to europe um you know on various deals and so i'm, I'm comfortable um assisting you you know with, with with those transactions too i mean doing the financial due diligence i'm, I'm comfortable and especially now i mean now that this new revenue recognition is in it's asc 606 in the united states it's supposed to bring international conformity to revenue recognition and a lot of I think it's IFERS, um, is it 15? It's, it's, there's an IFERS that corresponds to it. And it finally, you know, brings international uniformity to revenue recognition, whereas before, you know, it was country specific. Now there's one set of rules. So it makes it even easier for guys like me, you know, to go in and, and do diligence on, you know, companies in the UK or anywhere else. Um, you know, and, and so I, I've done, the deals I've done um, in France, I've done in, in Holland, you know, those areas I've done, deals in Costa Rica, you know, in Central America, I, I've, I've done projects in China. So, um, you know, I, I, I have that type of background that I can bring to it. So, so good yeah, stuff. Thank you. Yeah. I'm here for you. So, Bill, so good stuff, massive. I think, I think, I think, then. Uh, yeah, I, I was just going to say, I think I speak for everyone here that we truly appreciate your time and just the value that you've added in just this conversation alone. Um, well, it, it's worth it's worth its weight in gold. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Well, as I said, if you want uh, to be tortured as I've tortured ANSI, you know, just uh, link with me on LinkedIn or email me and, and tell me what you're interested in. Tell me. I do believe I have. You should see a, a connection from a Samuel List. Really? Oh, cool. Check, All check right, out, Bill. Done. There's a couple people that have already reached out to you, so, you know, they're, okay, they're you, ready to go to work. Said, um, if there's a financial yeah, topic you're interested in, if there's any financial topic you're interested in, like financing or valuation or diligence or taxes or whatever, 
it's likely I've written on it many times. So I, I hey, would send uh, it to the latest. Uh, what about uh, what about law firms? By the way, are you able to? Do you have any relationships with law firms that? Oh you yeah, absolutely, absolutely, to? absolutely. I got some great people out there. You bet. Yeah, no worries about that either. <laughs> so guys, yeah, no, I, Bill's I, hooking you up with accounting, with law firms, <laughs> with finance. What more do you want? What more I'm do the you full want? service, uh, full service diligence not guy. Yeah, that, yeah. Not only that, articles. Come on, come <laughs> on, Bill. We need those articles. We got to share it with the people. Get them educated. <laughs> I, I got hundreds of them. Everybody's hundreds telling of them. you thank you. Everybody's telling you thank you, Bill. All right. Very good. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, uh, everyone, and, you know, hope I hear from you. You know, it's it's wonderful meeting everyone. So Absolutely. thank you so much. We'll keep in touch, Bill. Thank you very much for this conversation. Thank you for